Hey YouTube, this is Ian from Big Rock Moto and Outdoors. So what am I doing sitting in my wife's car today? So I wasn't banished to the garage because I bought too many motorcycles. But what I have for you today is a long-term ownership review of my wife and I's Mazda CX-5. This is a 2017 CX-5 Grand Touring all-wheel drive. Now I know this is a motorcycle focused channel, but occasionally I'm going to have car or truck reviews, RV reviews, and other videos. So if you're not interested in this content, that's okay. Just wait till the next video in a few days. If you're looking in a segment of compact crossover SUVs, this is probably on your list. And if it's not on your list, it definitely should be. So we've owned this car for two and a half years and put around 20,000 miles on it. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do a long-term ownership review of this car. We're going to talk about why we chose this over the competition. We're going to take a look at the exterior and the interior, what we like and what we don't like about those things. We're going to have a section on the practicality and livability of this car, things like miles per gallon, cargo space, things like that. I'm going to talk about driving impressions, then I'm going to get into some things that we don't like about it, and then we're going to conclude by talking about would we buy this car again. Okay, so let's start out by talking about why we chose this over the competition. So we had had a 2006 Toyota RAV4 with the V6 prior to this car. My wife had also owned a Nissan Altima before we moved up here to the mountains. Now my vehicle history is a lot more complex. I've had everything from three or four different Miatas to Mustangs to trucks to other sedans and SUVs. So my background is a lot more varied. Now my wife and I both drive this car. I drive it most of the time even though it's technically her car. So we needed to replace the RAV4 which was getting old and up in years. And so I went out and I looked at all the cars in this category. The CX-5 when it was redesigned in 2017, which was the time we were shopping, stood out for a lot of different reasons. This car had really excellent styling, at least in our opinion. It had sporty driving dynamics. It seemed to be the classiest and sort of most elegant entry in this, in this category. It was just the perfect size for us. We didn't want something too big like a Highlander. We also didn't want too, something too small like a subcompact SUV. We needed something with all-wheel drive, something that got decent fuel mileage, something that we could take out to a nice dinner, but something we could also use to drive in the snow and drive in the mountains and just do deal with our day-to-day -day lives. So when we bought this car, we didn't have kids. Since we did buy the car, we've had a baby who's now four months old. Another reason that we chose this car is that I'm a big believer in Mazda as a company. I love the fact that they're a small independent car company and I just like the ethos of what they do. They believe in sportiness, they believe in driving dynamics and they still care about that in a time when most companies only care about you know, selling the most number of units and giving the most cargo space and putting a CVT in everything, basically making vanilla type cars and, and Mazda doesn't do that. So what are the competitors in this category? So, you know, you can look this up online, places like Car and Driver, but really we were shopping this against um, similar competitors like the Toyota RAV4 is going to come to mind. We had an older RAV4. Uh, the Honda CRV is obviously a great entry here and one of the class leaders. There's also other entries like the Subaru Forester is, is really, really popular, especially in mountain towns like where we live. You had things like the Jeep Cherokee, you had the Nissan Rogue, and you had a lot of other competitors. Um, but as I go through this video, we'll talk about sort of why we chose this over those other cars. When we looked at everything compared to this, now obviously I was going into this with kind of a bias towards Mazda. But when I tried to be objective about it and look at it, I found a lot of the other cars had gone to CVT transmissions, which I don't really love the way CVTs drive, although I do admit they're getting much, much better these days, and some of them you can barely tell. I like the styling of this car. I liked the value that it presented. Again, going back to the sporty driving that Mazdas are known for, and they, and they still put into their cars, even their SUVs. And overall, this just seemed like really like the most upscale in this entire category, but the price is really, really competitive. So we figured, how could we go wrong with it? Exterior styling, when we talk about this on a car, it's extremely subjective. It's really just about opinion. Now there are polarizing cars, like I don't think any of you would say that the Pontiac Aztec was a good looking car. And on the other end, I don't think any of you would look at this and say, oh, that's a bad looking car. So there are some examples we can pick from. But overall, we find that this car is very good looking, very classy and elegant looking from just about any angle you look at it. The proportions are right, and it just seems to have an upscale feel. It's not overstyled with too many crazy lines. We also love the color choices that were available. And in this sole red crystal, I'll put a better picture here because obviously the lighting isn't very good right now. But we, this car looks absolutely incredible in the sunlight and in changing light conditions. And that's something that made it stood out and you know made it really a nice car for us. 
I really like the dark finish of the wheels with the silver accents. They, even though they're dirty right now, they really don't look dirty. So that's kind of a nice thing over having polished bright wheels. Some things that I don't really love, I don't like all of the um, sort of black colored uh, unpainted plastics all over the car, although I noticed that as a trend in today's car world. Also the grill up here on the front with this sort of 3D uh, shape, it looks really nice, but it's a little bit hard to clean. So that's something to keep in mind. Let's talk about the interior of this car, the styling and the features. So getting inside of this car, you'd almost think you're getting into a luxury car. When you look at the finishes, the quality, the choice of materials, how things fit together, the stitching, the style of it, you might think you're getting into an Audi. And that's a huge compliment I'm giving to Mazda because if you got into some of their older cars, they weren't really quite as good as this. Somewhere, I think when they brought this car out in 2017 is when they took a huge leap forward in terms of interior refinement and quality and class and elegance. Honestly, the interior is one of the big things that really sold us on getting this car. Now keep in mind that my wife is not like me. With her money, she's very conservative. She's gonna keep this car five, 10, 15 years perhaps, whereas I go through vehicles every couple years because I'm irresponsible and a bad husband and squandering our child's future. So when I was shopping and helping her get this car, I really wanted to get something that I knew we were gonna be happy with and feel was a nice car for a long time, even as new stuff came out. And I think because this is so nice and so classy, I think it will age well and I think we'll be happy with it into the future. So some things to point out about the interior. I mentioned the styling and the fit and finish is very, very good. The quality is very, very good. I like the controls, how easy to use they are. The manual shift shifter, I really, really like. The buttons are very easy to figure out. You've got manual climate control dials right here in this nice silver finish. The heated seat buttons are right here, no going into a computer to get to them. The steering wheel is not too cluttered. Now the infotainment, I'm not going to deep dive into this because other videos have covered it, but the infotainment on this car is pretty lacking. So in 2017, they did not come with Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Now I can upgrade this one to have that, and the newer ones come with that, so that's good. I would just honestly just use your Apple CarPlay, your Android Auto, and forget about the built-in features because it's really difficult to use. I don't so much mind the control interface itself, the dial and the buttons here, they're fairly intuitive, but the actual interface, the software is really slow and clunky and just not very modern. Also, the screen could be bigger. Let's talk about the seating for a second. Now you can see we got the parchment leather, which I think is gorgeous, and I think it's a huge, uh, wonderful contrast to the dark exterior red color. This is the car that they feature on the brochures, and so I figured, well, we'll just buy that one because it looks really good. The downside of having a really light colored leather like this is you better keep on top of your cleaning. If you're kind of messy, or if you have kids, or any of the above, you're gonna really have to keep on top of cleaning this um, if you want it to stay looking nice. Now, I'm OCD with my cars and, and our cars that we have, so it's not a problem for me, but something to keep in mind if, if you're not too careful with your car. If you're like that, you probably, for most people, the black leather or something like a brown leather is probably gonna be better. Although I still love a light color leather, I think it's the best color. In terms of uh, room and practicality on the inside, we'll talk more about that, but uh, the rear seat room is okay. I'll put up a chart here um, compared to its competition. And the cargo room is average. It's not great, but it's also not terrible. Some of the competitors have more room, but again, um, it's fine, it's enough. Um, this, going back to the seating, the lumbar support is really lacking on this car. And the, and the front seats have adjustable lumbar, but they don't extend out far enough. So they don't give you enough support. So he has the adjustment, but they just need to come out further to give you more lumbar for your lower back. So that's something that they need to improve. One quick change I did to it is I did put in Husky floor mat liners. I don't like having cloth floor mats. I mean, no matter where I live, I like to have the carpet, but especially living up here in the mountains where we have snow and ice and mud, I really like to have these. I can vacuum them out, wipe them down, and it looks, looks new again. So that's a nice thing. Let's talk about some of the practicality and the livability of this car. So why don't we start with fuel mileage? That's something that's on everyone's mind. Uh, fuel mileage, the EPA rates this car at 23 city, 29 highway, 26 combined. Now that's for the 2017 model with the uh, two and a half liter naturally aspirated engine for the all wheel drive version. The non all wheel drive gets a little bit better. Now we, our experience with the fuel economy has been pretty much exactly on those EPA numbers. So we've seen as low as 23, 24 for mostly driving around town um, and as high as 31, 32 on the highway, but more like the 29 that they quote. 
So overall, over the three years we've owned this, we've averaged around 26 to 27 miles a gallon, which is right at that combined rating. So um, I guess EPA, Mazda, good job on figuring that out. I mentioned the, the interior volume of the car. Um, again, you have to keep in mind the class that it's in. So um, when you look at the competitors, the CRV and the RAV4 uh, have a little bit more room than this, but not a huge amount. So you just have to go sit in all of them and see if that's a big difference for you. We've been able to carry around our kid and our rear-facing car seat just fine, do our Costco runs as long as you don't get crazy with Costco, and it's perfectly, it's perfectly acceptable. The rear seat is comfortable for adults, for kids, whatever you might want to put back there. And the cargo room is, you know, because that's why everyone buys SUVs. It's got this big opening and you can fit just whatever you need back here. One thing about living with this car day to day that's really a good positive, this car is, in, is extremely quiet and refined out on the highway. At 75, 80 miles an hour, you can barely hear anything from the outside. The Mazda did a great job reducing NVH, which is noise, vibration, harshness. They have a lot of insulation under the car. They have a lot of like rubber and um, sort of carpet padding in the wheel wells. Uh, the glass has really good insulation. So when you're going down the highway, what this means is that you really are sort of um, in your own little capsule. Uh, it's so quiet, it's so relaxing to drive that we can drive this all day and not get tired. The all-wheel drive system. So um, we have a really steep driveway that gets covered in snow and ice. I have managed, of course, to get it stuck, uh, but I would get stuck in any car, even my truck with all-terrain tires on it. We've switched to Michelin Cross Climate tires, which are uh, a really awesome tire that maybe I'll cover in another review. Um, to give me better traction in snow and ice, and since switching to those, I haven't gotten stuck. Uh, the stock tires were terrible in snow. Um, the OEM tires, whatever they were, I think they were some sort of a Yokohama, um, just a cheap OE type tire. They really sucked, and they, they had to be replaced um, within like the first year, because we just couldn't go anywhere in the snow with it. It wasn't the all-wheel drive system that was causing the problem, it was the tires, and that's usually the case. This car uses regular gas, which is nice not to have to get premium gas. I mean, I guess that's something more you find in turbocharged cars or higher end cars. Also, I do my own oil changes and other maintenance, and the car is pretty easy to work on. To change oil, there is some, you know, paneling you have to take off underneath, which is pretty typical of any car. But other than that, nothing unusual, and uh, it's easy to work on. In terms of reliability, I mean, again, we've only had this car two and a half years. It's still a pretty new car, but nothing's gone wrong. There's been no TSBs, no recalls that I can remember, and we have never had to take it back to the dealer for a single thing. So since we bought it, it's never been back to the dealer. Also, on the livability front, the adaptive cruise control works awesome in this car. Um, it will take you down to a stop and then get you going again, but I think when you... You do have to press a button, I think, to resume once it's come to a complete stop, but adaptive cruise control, if you haven't used it, you really owe it to yourself to try it out on a modern car. I will never go back to having a car without the adaptive cruise control, and the fact that I could get that on this car was a huge selling point for me. Long drives, bumper to bumper traffic, stop and go like we have in California, real lifesaver. Let's talk just briefly about the driving dynamics of this car. So the car is not that powerful. I'll put up the specs here. I mean, keep in mind, it's a two and a half liter engine without any turbo. It's their so-called Skyactiv engine. I'm Skyactiv, like other um, things you hear, like EcoBoost or BlueTech or whatever it is, they're just meaningless marketing jargon, completely meaningless junk. Basically, all manufacturers are trying to engineer their engines to get good fuel economy. They're all doing the same thing, and that makes sense. So with the power figures in mind for what it is, it's just adequate, I would say. Um, I think if you loaded it up with a family and camping gear and went up into the mountains over you know, high-speed roads in the mountains, like going up uh, interstate passes through Colorado, and you're trying to overtake traffic, that's when you're gonna feel like, you know what, I really could use another 30 or 40 horsepower here and more torque as well. It makes the most of what it has. The six-speed transmission, which I love having versus a CVT, it shifts fast, it's responsive, it downshifts really quickly for you, it holds its gears really well. If you're gonna buy a Mazda CX-5 today, I would definitely recommend to test drive the standard engine and then also test drive the turbo engine and see which one is gonna meet your needs. Let's talk about the handling. That's one of the reasons that we like to stick with Mazda for our cars when we can, and one of the reasons we chose the CX-5 over the RAV4 and the CRV and the others. It's not that the other cars handle really badly by comparison, this just handles better. It feels connected to the road, the steering has weight and feel and heft to it, it communicates more to the driver, and it's just more fun. A good example that I give you is if I'm driving up the mountain road that goes to our house, which is like 25 miles up a mountain road, um, 
I can drive this car pretty hard for what it is and it doesn't feel too out of shape. If I do that in a RAV4 or a CRV or even something like a Forester or the other cars uh, which I've driven, they don't feel nearly as good as this. I'm not saying this is a sports car and the outright um, cornering grip may not be better than those other cars, but it just feels better to drive aggressively. I hope that makes some sense. If you've driven Mazdas, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. So while we do love this car, I do have a small list of things that are sort of dislikes or I wish that Mazda could do better. These aren't huge things and they're not meant to say I don't like the car, but just some things that you might want to watch out for. The biggest annoyance for me in driving this car is the blind spot monitor. The blind spot monitor is way too sensitive for me. It beeps when a car is way far behind me in the other lane and I try to get over turn on a turn signal and the thing's beeping at me all the time. Now my wife loves it. It's perfect for her driving style, which is very conservative. I'm not saying that I'm going cutting people off, but uh, it's just way too sensitive. I like blind spot monitors. I want to have it in my vehicle. My truck has it, but this thing is way too annoying and it beeps and uh, you can't adjust the sensitivity. So either make it less sensitive or give me a sensitivity adjustment would be a nice thing. I mentioned the power. So the power it's, uh, at times it could be more. Now, if you're buying a newer one, you have the option to get into turbo. I would recommend driving both. Like I said, for me, I would definitely absolutely get the turbo. It's just when we bought this, they didn't offer the turbo. So this was the only choice. Miles per gallon. Miles per gallon is okay. I mentioned we're getting the EPA estimates, which is great that we're getting that, uh, but it's not class leading at all. You trade off a little bit of miles per gallon going with a Mazda over like a CRV or a RAV4. Uh, now you have some hybrid options in this class, which are obviously going to get way better than that, but that's kind of apples and oranges because those are hybrids. Although that is a choice you could make if you're willing to pay that premium. If you compare this to the non-hybrid versions, it still gets a few miles per gallon less than the CRV or the RAV4. For us, it's a worthwhile price to pay for sort of just a sportier car, a little bit classier car. I mentioned the interior volume is a little bit on the small side. It's not terrible, but it could be a little bit larger. Uh, we knew what we were buying going into it. I knew the volumes of it. Um, it's slightly smaller than the RAV4, especially in the cargo area that, that we had before, but it's perfectly fine and it's not really a big issue. Just go test the car, put your kids in it, put your you know, stuff in it, and see if it's gonna be big enough for you before you buy it. I mentioned that we love the paint color, and we absolutely do. The Soul Red Crystal is beautiful. However, one thing I would caution you if you're gonna get the Soul Red Crystal is touching up the paint is very difficult. Not just for a body shop, which is still hard for them, but especially if you're gonna to get touch up paint and do it yourself with little scratches, it doesn't match very well and it's really hard to blend in. It's just a hard color to maintain. Um, scratches or any sort of damage you have is gonna be difficult to fix. If you're a car maintenance person, you're gonna wash it a lot, wax it, you know, keep it really nice, then you'll love it. If you're not so attentive to your cars, then you probably shouldn't get the Soul Red Crystal or any of the dark colored cars really for that matter. So would we buy this car again? I think that's a two-part question. Um, would we, if I could go back in time to 2017, would I buy this again? Yes, without a doubt, I think we made the right choice. Part two, if I was buying a car in this class today compared to the competitors, would I buy this again? I think the answer to that is probably yes. However, I would definitely get the turbo engine and I would get whatever trim level would get me the uh, cooled ventilated seats because that's a feature I like. Competition has gotten stiffer and now with the hybrid options in the market and the RAV4 Prime coming out with the electric range, it would be a much harder decision, but I think ultimately I do like that what Mazda stands for as a company. The styling of this car, I love the interior. Um, I love that it's easy to use, but kind of elegant and luxurious at the same time. When you consider the value of this car, I think it's priced very, very well for the features you get. I think this is still a, a great car, even against the current day competition. So I hope this review was helpful for you guys out there. I know I'm not really a car review channel, um, but if you want to see future car reviews, let me know down in the comments. Now, if you own a CX-5, let me know what your experience has been. Do you like the car and would you buy it again? Let me know down here below in the comments. If you like the video, if you want to see future content of car reviews and other things, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Please give me the thumbs up button on the video. That really helps me out. Keep in mind, I'm a non-sponsored channel. I have no corporate interests or sponsors whatsoever. I don't do Amazon affiliates. I don't do any of that stuff. And I try to remain as objective and unbiased as I possibly can. Again, I hope this was useful for you guys. If you're considering the CX-5 or any car in this category, let me know what kind of videos you want to see in the future. Thanks for your support. We'll see you out on the road. Drive safe.